Hello and welcome to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today's video is part of a series I do where I compare books with their movie adaptation. And before we get into the book and movie, I want to warn you that there will be spoilers for both, both the book and the movie. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, you should do that first and then come back and watch this video. I also want to tell you that this is available as a podcast. I will link to Spotify and Apple down below because those are the two most popular platforms. Thank you for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, let's get right into the book first movie. Hello and thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today I am joined by my sister, Michaeline. So Michaeline, welcome to the podcast and YouTube channel. Hi, excited to be here. <laughs> today we are talking about Where the Crawdads Sing, which is a book by Delia Owens published in 2018. And then the movie adaptation is directed by Olivia Newman and it was released this month, 2022. And to start with a book review portion, Michaeline, what did you think of this book? I really liked it. I thought that character development and just the way she described things like I feel like when you're reading a book if the author doesn't describe things well like I can't get into it because I need to like visualize what's happening and what's going on around them and what it looks like otherwise I can't really enjoy it so yeah I felt like that was really good and I listened to it to on audio I didn't read it and so I was kind of thrown off the way it kept going back and forth between like present and past so it took me I don't know, a little bit into the book to realize, oh, wait, like this is happening now, but this happened before. Because, yeah, otherwise, if I had been reading it, I would have paid more attention to the times they were saying and stuff. Right. But that was the only thing. It was audio. So I wasn't 100% paying attention to all those timelines. I read the book, so I didn't listen to the audio. But was the narrator good? Because they can like make or break an audio book. So they must have been good, though, since you liked it. Yeah, her voice was really good. I like it when... Like they changed their tone for men and women and like she had the accents and stuff too. So yeah, that added to it because then you'd feel more like immersed in the story. Right. Yeah. And I do agree it was like very vivid in my mind, like imagining the marsh because this takes place, I think it's like North Carolina, like in the swamp and in the marsh. And the way Owens describes the scenery and the animals, like, yeah, it was uh, like great imagery and it really brought it to life. I, I feel differently about the characters though. I feel like they weren't very nuanced and it was just kind of predictable <laughs> and cliche. And the two big things in this book are the romance and the murder mystery. And neither one I felt very engaged in. Like the romances felt like something out of a, like a young adult novel or something. And then the murder mystery, I also, I don't know, I didn't find it as engaging as I would have liked. But I'm glad that you do like it because I feel like that'll make for a better conversation since we feel, we don't feel the same way about it entirely. Well, and far as the romances, like this was a girl who lived in a marsh by herself basically all her life. So the romances aren't going to be super mature and adult anyway. Like she, she wasn't in society. So the romances well, I feel like were, were accurate to who the character was. And I will say for me, like I don't read young adult books. And part of that is because I don't enjoy reading about teenage romance. And the first romance in the book takes place when they're 17. And so teenage romances, I don't enjoy reading about. <laughs> but I will say like, because she was raised in the marsh by herself, I also feel like she should have had, she did have like some like animalistic instincts, like running from people and hiding, but I feel like she should have been even more wild because of that. So I felt that was a little inaccurate too. And she's like a marsh girl and yet she has two guys in love with her. Like what? <laughs> like, But she wasn't raised by animals, so she's not going to yeah. be animalistic. She still had her mom until she was like six, I think. Yeah. And then her dad was there until she was, uh, maybe like 10 yeah oh. and I guess she had jump in and Mabel yeah and she was still like going in and like being around people when she had to buy food and stuff so it's not like she was totally on her own yeah disconnected from society she still had to go and be around people yeah that's true but to move on to our general movie thoughts so I assumed that this would be a really good adaptation like a really faithful adaptation and it was like honestly like the main plot is exactly the same basically which we can get into some of the smaller details but yeah anything that was changed it was pretty minor and so I was surprised how much they were able to fit into the movie because it's not like it's crazy long but yeah what did you think of the movie um uh, the movie was good 
I mean, there was things that are left out. It's always going to happen because yeah. a movie can't include everything in a book. Otherwise, it'd be 12 hours long. It would be a TV show. Yeah. But there were still things that they left out of the movie that I felt like were kind of important to the story. So I was really bummed they left it out because it just kind of leaves like a gap there. Those different things. Yeah, one specifically, I don't know if you want me to bring it up because it's like halfway through the book. Uh, yeah, you can bring it up now. Okay. So uh, one of my biggest things that the movie left out that I felt like shouldn't have been left out from the book is when Tate leaves for college and he's like, I'm going to come back and see you. And like, I promise I'll come back and he never comes back. In the movie, it just shows he never comes back and she just, she meets Chase and whatnot and kind of moves on. But in the book, like they go back and like specify, yeah, Tate did come back and he saw her. And like you said, kind of being like animalistic and was like, I can't be with her. Like I'm in college. I'm like a part of society and she would not be able to be a part of society. And I felt like that was like a key thing in the book, like showing that he did come back and he saw her. like in this revelation. Yeah. And realized, wow, she really is a unique person. (laughs) And in the book, it was just totally left out. Like he just abandoned her and never came back. And I didn't like that. Yeah. And when he shows up, he says, like, I didn't think you could live in society. I had to choose, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I agree. I did notice that. And I wish they would have kept that part in. But before we get into more of the differences, what did you think of the performances? Like, did you like Daisy Edgar Jones as Kaya? Yeah, I liked her and her acting. I felt like it was authentic to the character. The only thing I was kind of like, uh, was her wardrobe. She was wearing really nice clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I know, like, in the book, they specify, like, she's getting donations from Mabel from the church and stuff and everything. But who donates? Oh, brand nice donations. Nice <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, I know this one is different because it's not like she was living, you know, in a normal life. But, two, this movie is like a period piece because it's the 50s and 60s. And I usually love movies like that because the wardrobes are always so cool. But I felt like their clothing was pretty normal. Like, they weren't wearing anything where it's like, oh, that's so 50s, 60s. Like, you can tell this is retro. So I felt like, yeah, the clothing, they were nice, but they didn't necessarily feel of the time. I feel like the guys' wardrobes were good and to the time because it was... 60s but it was like late 60s you know towards the end of it so yeah just her her wardrobe I just felt like was a little too fancy for being a marsh girl yeah (laughs) and then one other actor I want to mention real fast before we move on is the guy who plays I forget his name now Mr. Milton the lawyer so he is portrayed by David Straithrum I'm never sure how to say his last name but I thought he was great. I've covered him before in previous episodes. He was in Nightmare Alley and Dolores Claiborne, which I will link to. And he was amazing in both of those. And yeah, I thought he was really great in this one and really brought that warmth to the character of the lawyer, Mr. Milton. Yeah, definitely kind of like a, a protector. Yeah, feeling guilty for the way Kaya was treated and making up for it by defending her in the court case. And then just one more thing about wardrobe. So when I was reading the book, like it's in the South, he's a lawyer. I was picturing him in like a white suit. And he was wearing a white suit during part of the movie. I was like, okay, I imagined that accurately. Nice. (laughs) Also, Kaya's home was like exactly how I pictured it too. So I guess, again, Owens just described it really well. And so based on her description, they just brought it to life. So it was like, wow, like this is literally how I imagined it. Yeah. So to move on to the story. So we will start with Kaya's childhood because we begin in the book when the mom leaves. And then from there, her siblings leave one by one and she is left with her dad. And the reason everybody is leaving is because their dad is an abusive alcoholic. And so she is stuck with her dad for like, it didn't seem like very long, like maybe a year or two. And then eventually the dad just stops showing up. And during that time, she does receive a letter from her mom, but she doesn't find out what it says because the dad burns it. And yeah, from there, once the dad leaves, she gets help from, like we said, there's a black couple who owns a store, Jumpin' and Mabel. And so they are the ones who really help her and get her clothes and shoes and food and she sells muscles to them. And yeah, so this section of the story, her childhood, I thought was very similar from book to movie. I'm trying to think of like any big changes, but honestly, I mean, I'm sure they left stuff out. (laughs) But as far as her childhood goes, I thought it was very close to the book. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing about the childhood that I felt like didn't align with the book as much was the part where they get the letter from her mom 
where she's like super excited. And she's like, it's a letter from mom. And he like opens it right then and there. And in the book, I felt like, yeah, she had developed a better relationship with her dad at that point, but she still wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. She was still like very reserved and cautious around him. And so I felt like that part kind of um, didn't depict their relationship as accurately. She was too comfortable with him. Yeah, because she's still like, kept the letter and kind of was just like, oh, there's a letter instead of being like, oh my gosh, it's from mom. I'm so excited. Yeah. And I do remember when I was reading the book, I was just like, why is she giving him the letter? Like she should just be opening it. Like, what is she thinking? Whereas in the movie, it made more sense because she was just like, oh, hey, it's exciting. But I remember thinking in the book in particular, like, why would you give it to him? Like, just open it yourself. She couldn't read. What was she going to do? Oh. And she didn't talk to Tate at that time. She didn't have anyone to read it for her. Wow, that's so true. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, I guess that explains it then. <laughs> and then also, I really liked, uh, I don't know their names, but the actors who played Jumpin' and Mabel, they're like the same from book to movie, but I thought they did a really good job in their scenes too. There was one change where we get a scene with just Jumpin' and Mabel where Jumpin' is like hesitant to help out. And then Mabel is like, she says something about how, you know, like we're not told, like she quotes the Bible being like, we're not told to just sit around and stay out of things. Like we're, we need to help people. And so I really love that they added that scene. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting that they did that too, because obviously like you know they're they're religious people they talk about church and whatnot in the book but yeah yeah, having it in the movie where she's literally being like this is part of who we are as christians we believe whatever they are yeah and quoting the the bible i thought was really interesting and cool that they did put that in there because people can sometimes get up in arms when god is inserted into things where they're not naturally or originally there Yeah, yeah, true. And so moving on to this next phase in Kaya's life, she is now a teenager and she meets Tate. And she had known Tate from when she was a kid because he had been friends with her brother Jody. But when she's a teenager, they officially like start communicating and he even offers to help her to teach to teach her to read and write. And then from there, they form a romantic relationship and they start dating, like dating, but he only hangs out like on the marsh. It's not like they go out or anything. And then there's a moment where they are like making out and about to have sex, but then he stops and he's like, you know, I don't want to hurt you and we can't do this right now because I don't want to hurt you. And then I thought that was interesting though, because like we said, later on, he's like, I'm gonna come back during college, but then he comes back and he sees her and he decides not to. But clearly he had reservations early on too, because if he was like committed to her at that time, he wouldn't have hesitated to have sex with her, right? If he was like, I'm gonna be with her forever, like why would he not? So I feel like that shows that early on, he wasn't sure. I don't agree with that (laughs) at all. Um, So the way I took it was, He loved her, but he also had a lot of respect for her. And you have to keep in mind, at that time, she was only, like, between 13 and 15. She was a kid. Wait, I thought she was, like, at least 16 or 17. Because he was 18, because he was about to go to college. And she wasn't that much younger. And she was, yeah, she was a few years younger than him. Mm. So she was still underaged, you know? Oh, true. So, yeah, the way I took it was he loved her and respected her. And he wasn't going to push that, even though he really wanted it. And he would have been totally fine with going all the way and having sex. He was thinking about her and how it would affect her. And he says in the book, and I liked that they put it in the movie as well, like, you can be hurt more than I can from this. Like, if we end up doing this, like, you're going to be affected by it more than I will. And so I really like that. Like, it shows he was like a true gentleman. And like I said, respect. it was huge because Chase had no respect for her. Right. Yeah, when I read that part in the book, I thought of it more as him just having respect for her. But then in the movie, when I watched that part, I was like, you know, like she was down for it. (laughs) It's not like he was pushing it on her. So the fact that he's resistant, it made me think that like that showed he had reservations early on. But like you said, it could just be that, you know, she was young and he was like, you know, even if I do love you, we're just too young to be doing this. So that's true. And I did love the scene where he teaches her to read for the first time. I thought in book and movie, that was a great scene because yeah, after she reads, she says something about like, oh, like I didn't know how words could have so much power. So I really love that part. And then in the movie too, I liked how excited Tate was how, and this is from the book too, where he's like, you know, like way to go, Kaya, like never in your life will you not know how to read. And he's just super, you know, hooting and hollering. (laughs) 
So that was a cute scene. <laughs> yeah, and just telling her that now, like, there's nothing she can't learn. Yeah, true. And it's very empowering for her. Yeah, where she's felt very... Yeah. And then, you yeah, like, most of her life. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And in the book, when she starts her period, I was, like, waiting for that in the movie because I really liked that scene in the book where she's like, oh, my gosh, what's happening to me? I'm sick. And Tate comes in, and it just, like solidifies his good character and what how much he cares for her yeah. and he's like like the, there's this thing that happens with your body did you read those books I gave you kind of thing and this helps her understand what's going on with her because I think about that all the time like with stories where a girl is on her own like living out in the wild or she doesn't have like other females you would be so confused as to why that's happening. Yeah, like if I didn't know, like when I started my period, I would have been like, this is the worst pain ever. Like, do I have like some bodily issue? I would think I was dying too, like with the blood. <laughs> and then like if he hadn't told her, like she would have felt like horrible for a week, confused about what was going on. And then it happens again the next month, you know? <laughs> So yeah, I really liked that part too, because that's something I always think about is like, how how is she going to know what's happening with her body when she starts her period? And yeah. the fact that Tate was the one to be like, this is what's happening, like F Mabel for help. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was watching a movie review for this and the movie reviewers are called Fish Jelly, which I'll link to because I really like their movie reviews. But they talked about that too, because they hadn't read the book. And they were like, what about like they mentioned her period and just other things like how how did that work like who'd helped her and they assumed mabel must have you know told her which you would have thought mabel would have given her a heads up that would have made more sense in some ways but i guess she just didn't think of it but yeah so the book does address some of those things more so than the movie had yeah well and you it's not like she was hanging out with mabel at 10 she would go to sell muscles to jump in and buy gas and whatnot she wasn't going there to yeah. socialize and chat when she went to a chat person. It kind of surprised me too that like Mabel and Jumpin didn't just adopt her because they knew she was out there on her own. So how come they weren't like, come live with us? I don't know why they would. They were helping her live as best they could and she didn't want to. She liked living her life, I think. True. I mean, but I think she would have liked having a family around, you know. I will say when Mabel offers her the charity clothes and things, I was worried that Kaya would like be too proud and be like, I don't need that. And so I was so glad that she like was accepting of it and like wanted the help and the charity because I was worried they would like make her too proud. <laughs> and getting back to Tate, he gets into this really good college, but then he also gets a summer program before college starts. So he has to leave early. But like we talked about, he's like, you know, but I'll be back for the July 4th. So I'll come back and we can see each other. And like we talked about in the movie, he just doesn't show up and she wakes up all alone. Whereas in the book, he had seen her, but then he is like, I can't realistically be with her in my life. There was a scene in the movie where they're standing like in this green opening area. And then suddenly there's like a, they start blowing leaves all over. And then they're like, oh, I thought that was kind of cheesy. <laughs> and like the way they were like smiling as if it was so magical. I don't know, that moment I thought was kind of cheesy in the movie. I do feel like it was kind of cheesy and I was kind of like, oh this is kind of random but then I was also kind of like I mean it makes sense because like she was still a kid at the time and it kind of goes and it was right after he tells her like he's not gonna have sex with her right isn't it doesn't that happen right after this was like they don't have like almost have sex until later so this was beginning when they're like you know do you want to be my girlfriend and they kiss for the first time in that moment okay yeah I just felt like maybe they had put that in there to kind of like show her age like show that she was still a kid and she was still excited by things like that and Please. <laughs> just, yeah just to show like her maturity level because I mean it's hard in movies you can't you can't make a however old Daisy is a 20 something year old look like a 15 year old yeah. yeah which by the way Tate too like there's no way this guy is like 17 18 years old he looks way too mature so you kind of forget how young they're supposed to be because the actors are clearly so much older. Right. And I feel like maybe that's part of the reason they did put in that cheesy little catching the leaves thing to yeah. show. It. Reminds you of how young they were. True. And so moving on to Chase, because after Tate leaves her soon after this, she like is on the beach and she's, she, she sees this guy Chase, who is like this popular guy in town, who's kind of a jerk, really. But, but yeah. <laughs> 
And so like he notices her and eventually like he asks to take her out on a date and we find out, I don't know when we find out, but it's like from Tate's perspective, he knows that like the guys in town have this thing where it's like, ooh, like who's gonna take the Marsh girl's virginity? And so Chase is asking her out so that he can be the one to have sex with her. And he tries to have sex with her the first date, uh, but she's like, you know, I'm worth more than a picnic. <laughs> and if this is what you think of me, and she like storms off, but then he's able to convince her like, no, no, like I, I really do like you and you're so smart and beautiful. And so then they start dating for like a considerable length of time. In the book, there were some moments where it seemed like maybe he did have feelings for her. Of course he was still like a jerk, but there were moments where it seemed like, you know, you could understand why she was with him because there were moments where it was like, wow, like, okay, he seems like he does care for her maybe. Whereas in the movie, I never really felt that way with him. Yeah. I I would agree because yeah in the book there were times where I was like he does actually have feelings for her it's not just about who can get with the Marsh girl first otherwise he wouldn't have kept coming back exactly if that's all it was then he was dedicated because they were dating for a while right and in the book one of the differences I didn't like between book and movie was in the book when she starts talking about like shells and creatures and stuff in the marsh He's like, wow, like you're really smart. Like you're talking like educated and stuff, which he was thrown off by and intrigued by. Whereas in the movie, she starts talking about it and he's kind of like laughing at her because he's like, oh, wow, like here you are, like this uneducated girl using all these Latin terms for these species and shells yeah. and whatnot. So it was kind of more mocking in the movie where in the book, he was genuinely like, wow, wow, not what I expected. expected. Yeah. So. Yeah, in the movie, I felt like they made him much more much. dislikable. <laughs> yeah, same. And in both book and movie, though, he has to go out of town and he's like, you should come with me. And they get a hotel room. And so, you know, it's one bed. And so they end up having sex. And Kaya feels like she was like forced into it, manipulated into it because they had to share a room. And I don't remember how the scene was described in the book, but I did think it was a good scene in the movie because it just showed how she didn't mean anything to him. Yeah, and in the book, I I agree. The book and the movie for that particular scene was really solid because in the book, it was the same thing she was saying, how like it was just all about him enjoying himself. He wasn't like looking or thinking about how this was affecting her. He just wanted it and was done. Like in the book and the movie, after it's all done and he's got what he wanted, he's like, it'll get better for you the more we do it. Yeah. I feel like it's such like a selfish and insensitive thing to say and she's just kind of like yeah okay <laughs> um but yeah it definitely the movie portrayed it well to where he was just taking what he wanted from her and she was just kind of like I don't want to be lonely so I'm gonna go with it yeah in the movie as well because it's in the same scene that's when she gives him the necklace which I didn't like either like you just have this horrible sexual experience with him and then you're giving him a gift yeah, like they should yeah. have kept that more true to the book where she gave him the book at the beginning of their relationship yeah yeah because yeah and it's mentioned like so many times in the book like he always had that necklace on so he yeah. had it long before they went to that hotel and did all that you yeah. know yeah. so I didn't like that they changed that which why do you think in book and movie I guess in book particular why do you think he never took that necklace off even when he was engaged and not even seeing Kaya he would still always wear that necklace like in the book in particular why do you think that was in the book like I said like when he actually goes on a date with her and realizes she's this educated person he like finds her genuinely interesting and wants to get to know her and so him wearing the necklace all the time like it's because he did actually have feelings for her but he was always this jock who got whatever he wanted. And so that was still like rooted in him. And he also was worried about what society would think if he brought in the Marsh girl and married her. Right. So him wearing the necklace, I feel like was just a sign that he did actually have feelings for her. It wasn't just about who was going to have sex with her first and brag about it. Look, even though like he is a jerk and he obviously has some bad moments, it did seem like he was just more of a coward, if anything, because he wasn't brave enough to be like, you know what, I actually do love Kaya and she's the one I'm going to be with. Instead, he was like, well, I guess I'll marry Pearl because that's what I have to do. Whereas, yeah, in the movie, I just never got that feeling. And the fact that she gives him the necklace the day they the night they have sex made it seem like, is he wearing that necklace to be like this, you know, because it's associated with that moment now in the movie. Yeah, I didn't like that at all. But also like the whole like, 
not actually being with her and marrying Pearl. It's also a, like a level he was, he had a comfortable life. His parents were well off. Mm-hmm. He couldn't give that up. If he married the Marsh girl, he would have been written off and he would have lost all of that. Exactly. Going back to him just being a coward and not having the strength to like make it on his own. Yeah. And so moving on to the trial. So the book, the book begins, I think, with them finding Chase's body. And so the book goes back and forth in time between these detectives, which I thought the detective's dialogue was like super wooden in the book. But anyway, so they're trying to figure out who killed Chase. And we go back and forth in time between this murder mystery and Kaya's childhood and her teenagehood and whatever. Whereas the movie starts out with her being arrested and then Mr. Milton shows up and he's like, I can't defend you unless I know you. And so the movie sets it up where she's telling Mr. Milton about her life. But yeah, so <laughs> so people know that she had a relationship with Chase, plus they're just very prejudiced against her. So they are very quick to be like, Kaya did it, it was her. And so she is arrested and put on trial. Ultimately, she is found innocent. But yeah, so with this murder mystery throughout the book, like were you intrigued and who did who did you think did it like did it keep you guessing yeah I didn't I didn't think it was predictable at all because throughout the whole book I was like she didn't kill him she's got an alibi why would she do that you know but yeah so I kept on waiting like after the trial was over even I was like okay like when are we gonna find out who actually killed him because it wasn't Kaya did you have any guesses where you were like "Ooh, I bet it was this person um well I kept mentioning in the bookend movie that little red beanie the fibers the fibers yeah I couldn't think of the word and then yeah they have in the book that little playful back and forth with Tate and Kaya how they're like tossing Tossing it back and forth which I would kind of miss them having in the movie too like the back and forth they had with that beanie in the movie was just kind of like meh it was pretty (laughs) weak to me um but yeah so I was like if it wasn't Kaya, like it must have been Tate because he saw her after she had her black eye and was beaten by him. Which we forgot to mention that because after her and Chase's relationship ends because she finds out he's been engaged, uh, he starts like stalking her kind of and then he attempts to rape her and he hits her but she gets away from him and someone hears her shout like, if you bother me again, I'll kill you. And so that of course is evidence in the trial. So yeah, so Chase, she was like living in fear, worried that Chase was like, stalking her and coming after her and so that was another reason to make it seem like maybe she had killed him but yeah and Tate sees because he returns and he apologizes and he just wants to be her friend again and yeah and he sees that what has happened and jumpin also saw so at any point where you're like "Ooh, was it jumpin yeah that was my thing I was like he was either Tate or jumpin because jumpin was like a father like the only one who she really had in her life who was like a father figure and But it's also, it was really hard during that time. Like an African-American guy would not risk his life murdering someone, you know? Because he had kids. Yeah. So he had a lot to take care of. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. I just assumed it was Tate. And I don't know if it's too soon. But that was the other thing I wish they hadn't left out of the movie. In the book, after the trial's over, she sees the sheriff and deputy coming to take Tate. And her first thought is, oh my gosh, is like this linked to Chase's murder? And that was my first thought. Like, oh my gosh, it was him. Like they found some more evidence and now they're going to put him on trial. But then it turns out just being that his dad had passed away. So I felt like, yeah, that, that was a little suspense that they left out of the movie. And it was kind of sad that they didn't show his Tate's dad coming to trial because that was also a big... Oh, because the dad was even prejudiced against. Yeah, it was a big character, not development, maybe like a flaw in the dad, I guess, Mm because. Because he was a good person, but. Yeah, he was a good person and he cared about his son, but he was realizing like, I'm treating her like the rest of the town is and my son loves her and I should be supporting him. Yeah. I really liked that in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I will say as far as the mystery goes, like any time where Owens tried to make it seem like, oh, it could be Jumpin' or it could be Tate, like it was mainly those two. But my thought, like I never believed it because I was like, why would Tate kill Chase to protect Kaya and then allow Kaya to be put on trial and risk getting the death penalty? Like as soon as she was arrested, Tate would have stepped up and been like, no, it was me. And so I was like, so either Tate is like a horrible person who's helping Kaya, but not really. 
or it was Kaya or an accident or something. So that was my issue why I just wasn't believing that it could potentially be Tate or Jumpin. Cause same with Jumpin, if he had killed Chase, he also was like too good of a person to let Kaya go through this trial and potentially get the death penalty. Yeah, and I thought about that as well. But my other thought, like as I was reading the book was, okay, if it is Tate, then maybe he's just waiting to see if she's gonna get convicted. And if she is, then he'll stand up in court and be like, no, I'm <laughs> You know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I feel like part of what made the book so good is like even during the trial, you're trying to figure out like, okay, like what's going to happen next? Because you don't know. If it was super predictable, we would have been like, oh yeah, like she killed him for sure. Oh, yep. There it is. You know? <laughs> so yeah, the mystery I felt was laid out well. Yeah. I didn't love it, but you know, it wasn't the worst thing ever either. Uh, but yeah, and then the big reveal. So first of all, she takes Tate back, which were you happy she took him back? Or were you like, are you kidding me? He left her for five years. She shouldn't take him back. Or did you like that? No, she should have for sure taken him back. And after her brother comes and visits like that, yeah. I like listening to the audiobook and like hearing that part literally was like getting teary eyed, like, oh my gosh, she still has family. <laughs> and Like, especially yeah. him, because that's, she had the closest relationship with him. Yeah, so I felt like it was really good. And he was, he's like, Tate's a good guy. And he was, and he was more involved in the book with getting yeah. her books published than they showed in the movie. Yeah. Which by the way, her books were so pretty in the movie. Like I would want to buy books like that. <laughs> yeah, they were really cool. And her, I know they weren't Daisy's drawings, but the drawings, I was just like, wow. Yeah. yeah amazing. And the movie left out the fact that the brother, I guess, had like some paintings that had belonged to the mom because she had passed away. But one of the paintings showed Kaya with Tate when they were kids. And so that's a big moment for her in the book where she's like, wow, like, you know, it's always been Tate <laughs> or something like that. And so that's a big thing is what makes her forgive him and be willing to date him again. Yeah. And another thing, as far as like the family and stuff, the seagulls, like th her feeding the seagulls wasn't as big in the movie as it was in the book. True, because that was like her family sort of. Yeah, like in when her brother comes back, he's like, oh, yeah, that's something. I don't remember the sister's name. Oh, the sister would feed them. Yeah, the sister would feed them. And that was another thing in the book where when she was on trial and she was in jail, like she was worried about the seagulls. And Tate comes and he's like, don't worry, okay. like I'm feeding them. And I thought that was really sweet and kind of missing. He knows what's important to her. Yeah. And it only shows her feeding the seagulls once in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I honestly forgot about that part of the book, but that's true. That's a good point. And then to talk about her family some more too. So we find out that the mom went to her sister's home after she left and she was kind of in a daze. And then after a few months, she like comes to and she's like, wait a minute, I have kids. <laughs> And so she, I guess that's when she wrote the letter. And then in the letter, she's asking the husband, like, can I have my kids back or something? And the dad gets upset and he burns it. And then from there, the mom gets sick and then she's just not well enough to return home. Were you happy with that? Or were you like, come on, like she could have done something more. Like, why did she just write a letter? Like, why didn't she like show up with her sister and her brother-in-law and they're like, we're taking the kids, right? Like, did you really think writing a letter would make this abusive guy suddenly be like, oh yeah, sure, you win, you can have them. <laughs> I honestly thought it it made sense to me. And Kaya, after Chase comes back and tries to rape her and beats her, like, and they say in the book and movie how it gave her an understanding why her mom abandoned her. Because her whole life, she was like, why would my mom abandon me? And after experiencing that, she was like, okay, it makes sense. Because, like, how can you live like that? And her mom lived like that for years, you know? And... So when she wrote the letter asking for her kids, Kaya's dad responded to her and was like, if you try to come and take, the, or if you try to come and take the kids, I will kill them or something like that. He yeah. sounds like something super dramatic. Like I understand her not trying harder because like she was obviously like in a really bad mental state when she left and she didn't even realize what she had done until a lot of time had passed. So the fact that he, like, she knew what he was capable of. She lived with it for years and she didn't want to risk him harming her kids because as a mom, it's like, I dealt with it. 
but like if that's happening to my kids then like it's way but it probably was happening to the kids right because she's like i left them alone with this man they're being abused by him so i can either risk coming to save them or just allow them to continue living with him and knowing they're abused because that's the kind of guy he is so it's not like but i think you have to consider he was he was physically abusing her and that takes a huge mental toll on someone as well it's not the physical abuse isn't all that she suffered like she was mental and emotional abuse yeah and i i felt like i couldn't judge her for what she had done because it was an extremely abusive and difficult situation and it would be really hard knowing you have kids but living with your abusive husband so i don't know i mean she could have done more for sure but like I said, she wasn't mentally stable. She wasn't. Yeah. And with Jody too, like he is able to find Kaya because she has become a publisher writing books about the wildlife. And so he uses that to find her. But she had been home all along. And he says how like, wow, I wouldn't have thought to come back here. But that too, where it's like, why did he never, maybe he was never in the area, but you just assume like, oh, there's no way she could still be there. But like, why not check? You know, it's been so long. Like, if that's your starting point, why don't you go back there, check the house, talk to Jump and see if he knows what happened to Kaya. So it seemed like a lot of the family were just kind of lazy and not trying to get back. But at least he came back at some point. Yeah, it was also a different time. Nowadays, it's much easier to find people and to travel back then. And he was in the military. Yeah, it took a lot longer to travel. Um, You can't just call and like figure out. Facebook them. Yeah. So I don't know, it is tricky. And like kids living in that type of environment and escaping from it, it's not exactly something they want to go back to, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like I said, it was just the part where Jody comes back made me tear up a little because it was emotional. And it was like, she's finally someone came back for her kind of thing, you know? Sure. Yeah. Which is what she always wanted. <laughs> right. And then, so moving on to the ending, she gets with Tate. They don't get married because she's like, what we have is good enough. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah and so they stay in the same place but they make the home much nicer obviously and they're together their whole life and then when um kaya is an old woman she dies and then tate is going through her stuff because you know going through her stuff after she dies it's different from book to movie but basically in both he finds chase's necklace the shell necklace necklace which was taken from him when he was killed along with in the book there's a poem because throughout the book she's quoting this poet i forget the name and we find out that that is kaya she's been posting poems under a pseudonym and so we find a poem about a firefly who like attracts the males with her light only to kill them (laughs) and then the shell necklace so he's like wow like kaya had killed him and it's found like in the floorboards whereas in the movie it's like a journal she has and she has a picture of chase and it says something about like killing your predators and then she had like carved out a hole in the book and it's the necklace and so yeah what did you think of this reveal and also did you think kaya was justified in killing chase i mean i am kind of torn on that because i like i get he was Like you said, he was stalking her after that incident and still she felt in danger and living like that. And she didn't want to live like that. And she felt like her only out was to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So like I can see why she would feel that way. Especially since she was so into wildlife and that's how insects and animals handle things. (laughs) Right. And I was going to say that because they mentioned it multiple times in the book about how insects are with their mates. Like they basically just use them. To make babies and then they get rid of them. Um, But yeah, I I wouldn't necessarily say it was warranted. But then there was also the part where she's talking to jump in and she's like, I can't go to the police. It's the same as if you went to the police about something like this. They wouldn't take you seriously. They would side with the the rich white man, you know. So I can understand why she felt like that was her only option was to take care of things herself. Otherwise, she was live in fear for the rest of her life. But then as far as her like, or Tate finding the necklace at the end of the book. I felt like that was better because it showed like she literally like was hiding it and it was something she didn't want anyone to find. Whereas in the in the movie, it was just this book that she had openly, like anyone could have opened mm-hmm. up and found it. Yeah. So I felt like that was kind of, um, it didn't make as much sense to me to just have it out in the open. Yeah. And how did the detectives, like, I guess they would have had to have looked through every single book she had, but because they searched her home and didn't find the necklace, like that was a part of it. But yeah, and that's why having it under the floorboards 
made more sense to me and yeah. Tate finding it. Yeah. And I honestly, like I felt for Tate, like seeing that yeah. like, he had lived <laughs> his whole life with his wife. And she had this huge secret she never bothered to tell him about. <laughs> yeah. And it's just crazy to me. And like, she probably didn't want to burden him with sharing that kind of knowledge with him because that would have changed things. I mean, I'm sure he still would have stayed with her because he still loved her, but she probably didn't want to yeah, burden him with that, that yeah. kind of not her. So yeah, I felt for him, but in the book, didn't he take, like he takes the, the string off and he throws it in the fire, which they didn't show in the movie. And then he like, doesn't he crack the shell and throw it? Oh, uh, I don't remember. In the movie, he just tosses it in the ocean. But yeah, I don't specifically remember in the book. And I feel like the reason, like in the book, like they specified, like he snapped it in half is because it's a shell with a hole. You're not going to yeah. find a shell with a hole like that. If you snap it in half, then it... It's also a unique shell that's not normally found in the area. Seems like he could have found a better way than just tossing it in the ocean even, because that could just wash back up on shore. But I guess at that point, it's been so long that people like don't even care because it's been decades, right? That's true. But yeah, it would still be shocking to find out. Which I thought it was a cool reveal in the book. And I liked that like it took so long for it to officially happen because then they move on and they're together and it's this long thing. And so it's not until the end. So that caught me by surprise how long it took that it wasn't until she died that the truth was found out. But yeah, I think in the movie, one reason, like we said, they made Chase much more unlikable. And I think it's because maybe with the book, people were like, I mean, did he deserve to be murdered? I feel like she, I don't know, it would have been a totally different book, but I think she could have done something where it's like she threatens him in some way. Like, I don't know what kind of threat it would have to have been, but she would have to scare him enough that he feels threatened enough to never bother her again. Like that could have been a good book too, where she just does some cool thing where she's just super scary and threatening, but instead she just kills him. So yeah, I feel like in the movie, they were like, you know what, we need to make Chase really despicable. <laughs> that way people are on board and glad for Kaya doing that. Because in the book, yeah, it's, I didn't like Chase, but yeah, it's like, man, like murder seems pretty harsh though. But without the murder, it wouldn't have been much of a book. Yeah, like I said, without that, it would have totally changed the whole book. But another thing too, where the murder aspect, getting into Delia Owens now, because so Delia Owens, she is like a naturalist and she's written nature books. And then she and her husband and her children spent time in Africa, like animal conservation and protecting the environment and protecting the animals. And in the 90s, there was a poacher that was killed, I think by her son. And he killed this poacher because the Owens, kind of like Kaya, were taking justice into their own hands and killing this guy who was doing something that was wrong. This was in Zambia. I think it's the country, Zambia. And they were never charged with it and they got away from it and they're not allowed back in Zambia and they like deny being part of it. But so it's like reflective of Kaya, right? Where she got away with this justified murder and it's not until years later where it's found out. But even when it's found out, it's like, well, the guy was a bad guy anyway. And so, so yeah, like she was like allegedly complicit in the murder of a poacher which poaching is wrong, but you know, deciding to take justice on yourself and kill him is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so it seems weird, even if Delia Owens, even if that wasn't true and it's like, oh, she actually had nothing to do with that. The fact that it's still associated with her, it seems weird that she would write a book about a character killing someone, you know, like I said, taking justice into their own hands and killing someone over something, but feeling good about it. So that too just made the book feel weird being like, why? Why did she choose to write a book like this? So, um, because of what happened with her, she knew it would get publicity. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the 90s, uh, like there was a documentary that aired on like ABC or something, which I'm, I'll, I'll link to the article in case I'm getting this wrong. People can look at the article. And so when the book was released, people were like, Delia Owens, like that name sounds familiar. And so then they looked back and they're like, wow, like two decades ago, she was accused of this murder. So part of me wonders like, did she just... She had to have known that she would be connected and remembered for that. Like, was there a part of her that hoped people would have just forgotten? Or was she aware, like, you know, they'll make this connection, but whatever. I mean, had she not started the book until after the whole poaching incident? Yeah, that was in the 90s. The book came out in 2018. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe she figured she got a lot of attention for that. So she's like, I should just write a book about it. <laughs> but make some little changes here and there. <laughs> But yeah, so I thought we should mention that because that is, I don't know, some controversy around her and it does 
Yeah, like I said, it makes me feel a little weird about the character of Kaya and like what was Owens trying to get across? Like, is there a deeper meaning as far as her own life in this book? And or was she just trying to tell a story? Yeah, I don't feel like her story and the story of the where the crawdads sing. I mean, other than there being a murder, I don't feel like there's a whole lot connected to it. They're totally different situations. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I guess we can move on to book first movie. I think I already know your answer, but which one did you think was better and why? The movie was better. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> the book for sure. There, like I said, there was just a lot more detail. Movies, you can't include as much detail as there is in the books. And it just, it was a good story. There was a lot of little details that added into why Kaya was who she was and why... She murdered him. And in the movie, I feel like there there really was only the him trying to rape her and kind of stalking her afterwards being the only motive. And in the book, it explains that there was more than that. There was the correlation with her mom and her mom being abused and running away from that all her life, you know, and she didn't want to abandon the life she had. She liked it. And this guy wasn't going to leave her alone. <laughs> Which I wanted to mention too, in the book, I'm pretty sure, like she just remembers her mom leaving one day. And it's not until I think when like Chase hits her or something where suddenly she remembers like, oh, that very morning my dad had hit my mom and then she left. And so it's this big moment in the book where she like remembers the abuse her mom went through. Uh, so I like that too in the book that it, she had like blocked it from her memory. But anyway, yeah, I would agree. I think the book wins. The movie is like a really faithful adaptation though. So if someone watched the movie and if they're not like a huge book person, then I'd be like, yeah, you're good. You don't need to read the book. <laughs> but I, like you said, there are like just more subtleties and more details in the book, of course. But yeah, I was impressed with the movie adaptation. It was very faithful and I enjoyed the performances for the most part. And the scenery, of course, was very pretty, which, you know, the southern swamps and the Spanish moss and the lakes. And so, yeah, I did think it was a good movie. I don't understand why um, movies do this, though. The movie was filmed in Louisiana. Like, why not just keep it authentic and film it in the state that the book was based in? <laughs> Maybe it's more expensive to film in North Carolina and maybe it's easier to get permits for Louisiana or yeah, maybe technical reasons. Yeah, but it was still, I mean, still an accurate depiction for sure of the surroundings and where she lived. So yeah, ultimately, like, I don't see myself ever reading the book or watching the movie again, really, because I like I said, I didn't like love either one. They were just like, and again, like the book was on the number one bestseller list for so long. And that confuses me because I think the book was fine, like it was good, but I didn't think it was that good. But anyway, overall, I will say the movie wins though. But if you've seen the movie, wait, did I say the movie? I mean, the book wins. But like I said, the movie is a very faithful adaptation. Yeah, I think they were well done. I enjoyed both. But yeah, it's not when I will be like, oh, I gotta see that again, and again, and again, and again. <laughs> and also, I think I don't think the movie is worth seeing in theaters, but once it's available to stream, when you can like get up and, you know, go to the kitchen or whatever, take a break, it's fine. But I wouldn't recommend people to see it in theaters. I think it's fine to just wait till it's streaming. That's really harsh. And you don't wanna... Because some movies have like a theater experience where it's like, wow, the big screen made this so much better. Whereas this one, there wasn't anything about the movie theater that like made the experience so much better, I didn't think. I mean, it was worth the $10 I spent to see it. <laughs> so I wouldn't yeah. I don't know, feel like you're being a little too harsh saying <laughs> go to the theaters and see it. It's, it's not that great. <laughs> Well, also sometimes like maybe there were times when I wasn't super engaged and I was like, Ugh, I wish I could scroll my phone right now, <laughs> but you can't because you're in a theater. <laughs> but, you know, if people see it in theaters, it's, it's still fine. But anyway. <laughs> but as far as like not feeling the need to read it again, totally agree. But um, The Nightingale is a book oh, yeah. I've been wanting to read again because that one was yeah. pretty good and what is going on with the movie it keeps getting pushed back is it never gonna come out i thought i saw i thought it was december but did it get pushed back again well it was supposed to come out like when we read the book like for our book group it was supposed yeah. to come out the next year and then it got pushed back to the year after that and then yeah i looked it up like a couple months ago and it said later this year yeah, because I'm I'm going to be rereading that one in preparation for the movie. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, because I loved that book. It was hard to read because it's a hard story. 
but the topic so good yeah. yeah I feel like the movie is going to be really hard to watch too but yeah I'm excited for that one and that's another one where like all of us sisters have read Where the Crawdads Sing and I think I don't know if Trudy read The Nightingale but I know everyone else has so I'll definitely want at least one of you sisters on to cover The Nightingale that'll be cool that wraps it up unless you have any other final thoughts nope the other things I have on this paper are cheese sticks and nail plaster remover because I need to <laughs> <in> the story. <laughs> um, so then we both agree that the book wins, but the movie is also a very good adaptation. So thank you, Michaeline, once again for joining me. I have now had all of my sisters on this podcast, so that is awesome. All of us are big readers. I mean, I feel like you probably read the least. I'm Yeah, I'm probably the least of the readers in yeah. the family. But this is audiobooks is like a game changer. Oh, yeah, definitely. But yeah, so thank you for coming on the podcast. It was great talking to you. And I will say that I had more negative feelings about the book and the movie. But I think talking to you has helped me be like, you know, what? maybe it's not as terrible <laughs> as I thought it was. Uh, and thank you to those listening and watching. Don't forget to subscribe, comment your thoughts down below. Give this a thumbs up. And join me next week when I'm talking about Dr. Sleep, which is a Stephen King book. So very exciting to get into that one. It is the sequel to The Shining, which I know Michaeline is a huge fan of. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Michaeline doesn't like scary movies. But anyway, so join me next week for that. And thank you again for listening or watching. And I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.